Stanford University. Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Delp. I'm a professor in bioengineering and mechanical engineering orthopedic surgery. I also am one of the loyal and faithful deputy directors of the Stanford Neuroscience Institute. Here, here. So I serve Bill every week. And in uh, my role uh, as deputy director, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Anne Bernay. So Anne is a professor in the Department of Genetics here at Stanford. She studies uh, the genes that regulate lifespan and how the products of these genes interact with environmental influences to promote longevity. And I remember when I first met and I got super interested in her work and uh, started reading her papers. I'm staying up late at night and uh, it has nothing to do with my own research at all. I'm like, why am I so interested in this work? It's incredibly creative. And what it, what it made me think of was that I think it has something to do with this Woody Allen quote which is that I don't want to live on through my work. I want to live on by not dying. <laughs> and it's, of course, partly that, but also just the fundamental science and the creative work that Anne's doing that inspires us. And I, I find her work really fascinating, and I'm sure you will, too. So please join me in welcoming Anne Brene to the podium. So uh, good morning, everyone. And first of all, I'd like to thank Bill for putting this great uh, symposium together. And thank you for being here today. All right. So um, as depicted by Rembrandt here, who painted himself every uh, year of his life, aging is accompanied by a, a series of outward changes. It's also accompanied by functional decline, diminished resilience, susceptibility to a constellation of diseases, and at the end, system failure and death. So in terms of thinking about disease, aging in human is accompanied by the striking onset of a wide variety of diseases. And if we think about the brain, really what's striking is the exponential increase in neurodegenerative diseases, and in particular, Alzheimer's disease. Now, even in uh, humans that do not have neurodegenerative disease, that do not have Alzheimer's, aging is accompanied by cognitive decline, especially in high cognitive function. So there is decline in working memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, and speed of processing. It all starts pretty early, but it keeps declining. So those observations really do raise a fundamental question, which is whether aging is just a one-way downward slope, one-way road towards de uh, decline, disease, and death, or whether there is some plasticity to the system, and whether understanding aging per se can give us some new insights into the constellation of diseases, and in particular, neurodegenerative diseases, for which age is actually the prime risk factors. And for the longest time, aging was thought to just be actually the byproduct of wear and tear. But this view has completely changed because in the past 20 years, the aging field has truly emerged as a field that has shown that aging is actually a regulatable process that can be modulated by specific genes, and it can also be regulated by environmental factors, and I'll give examples in the next slides. There is also some exciting evidence here at Stanford, uh, that were pioneered here at Stanford that some aspects of aging, some hallmarks of aging, can actually be reversed. So in the next three slides, I'll give some examples of genes, environmental factors, and factors that can reverse uh, at least some hallmarks of aging. So in terms of genes, experiments that ranged from model systems, such as the tiny little worm C. elegans, up until humans, have really highlighted uh, a few pathways that are really critical to regulate aging in a conserved manner from the tiny worms all the way up to humans. 
and in particular this insulin FOXO pathway that has been uh, that is very conserved and that has been shown in several cohorts of centenarians, whether it's in America, Europe, or Asia, to be associated with exceptional longevity, being a centenarian, more than 100 years old and even more than 110 years old. So that's those are examples of genes that can actually be associated with exceptional longevity. What about environmental stimuli? Well, it's becoming clear that there are several environmental ways and even drugs that can affect the rate of aging. Dietary restriction, restriction in food intake but without malnutrition has been shown to extend lifespan uh, and decrease signs of aging at least all the way from yeast to even primate, at least for decreasing the, the signs of aging. Exercise has been shown to increase health span, the time that people stay healthy. And a few drugs, and especially rapamycin, uh, microlide antibiotics that's found on the Rapa Nui, uh, on the Eastern Island, that's why I put that here, has been shown to extend lifespan even in, in mammals. Metformin is now in, um, proposed in clinical trial for potentially decreasing signs of aging, even in humans, and resveratrol, a product of grape, also shows some uh, promising signs for uh, affecting the rate of aging or health span. So those are examples of environmental factors that can slow the rate of aging. But what about reversal of some of the hallmarks of an already old organism? And in fact, studies that have been pioneered here at Stanford, first by Tom Rendo in the muscles and also by now Tony Wiskore here uh, in the brain, have shown that pairing, there are some blood circulating factors and you can pair a young animal with an old animal by the blood circulation so that they exchange blood and that pairing a young animal with an old animal can reverse some of the hallmarks of aging in the already old uh, organism. And Tony is working with identifying the factors here. So this is really remarkable that aging is such a plastic process that can be slowed and in some cases, at least for some hallmarks, reverted. So in our lab, we are fascinated by this plasticity of the aging process. And we are very interested in using model systems to discover new genes or new paradigms for the regulation of lifespan, taking advantage of the rapid nature of the, the lifespan of those model organisms. So we are using the worm Senorabitis elegans because it recapitulates an entire lifespan in 20 days and is very amenable for genetic screening. We are also developing a fish model for lifespan because fish are closer, of course, to humans than worms are and they harbor features that are much more resembling of what happens in us, but this fish is very short-lived. And of course, we're very interested in understanding and learn specific principles from long-lived species or cells. So we're using mice and cells from mice, and in particular, the cell type that we're primarily interested in in our lab are stem cells because of their regenerative potential and stem cells in the brain. So today, what I thought I would do is present you with uh, uh, studies that we are doing in our lab First, using the stem cells in the brain, the neural stem cells, and what happens with aging in stem cells in our brains. And second, to present you with our effort to pioneer a new model systems for lifespan that we think has great promise to identify new genes, new drugs even that can delay or even reverse the aging system. So first, the stem cells in our brain. So this project in our lab starts from the observation, as I said in the beginning, that cognitive function declines in, uh, during the aging process. And this really raises fundamental questions. The first one is could preserving or activating those regenerative cells, this pool, this reservoir of regenerative cells that we all have in our brain, be important to prolong the health of the tissue, and even that that's a long-term, even lifespan. And then the second question is that could stem cells, whether it's in our brains or in our other tissues, because of their regenerative potential, in a way they, they have found this way of dividing in, uh, in an infinite quote-unquote manner. So could they 
teach us something about rejuvenation, quote unquote, or immortality, quote unquote. OK, so we all have stem cells in our brain. This is uh, depicted here for the mouse brain, but it's the same in the, similar in the human brain, where we have two reservoirs, two pockets, if you wish, of stem cells in the adult that are still present in the adult brain, in the subventricular zone here in orange and in the dented gyrus of the hippocampus. Those stem cells have two remarkable properties. On the one hand, they can self-renew, which is giving rise to new stem cells. On the other end, another remarkable property is that they can also give rise to all the three cell types that are uh, forming the adult brain, neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. And by exquisite genetic techniques in mice, they've been shown to Gen the new neurons that are found to be born for the neural stem cells have been found to be very important, even if they're not very numerous. They are very important for some aspects of learning and memory, as well as olfactory discrimination. They can integrate into functional circuits, those new neurons in the adult brain. And they've recently been shown in humans, actually, to be important probably for the repair that can occur after stroke. So those stem cells are not very numerous in our brain, but they really have important function, both in homeostasis, normal function for le learning new tasks or learning new memories, as well as for potentially repair of injuries or even repair in cases of neurodegeneration. However, what happens during aging to those stem cells? And in fact, aging does impair the ability of those neural stem cells to activate and produce, to proliferate more and produce uh, their progeny, in particular neurons. And neurons, the, the ability to form new neurons is particularly affected. And they become skewed towards giving rise to astrocytes at the expense of neurons or oligodendrocytes. So, one of the questions that we've been asking in our lab is, could genes that have been discovered based on the fact that they are associated with exceptional longevity, like this FOXO gene that I mentioned, could they actually serve a role? What role do they play in the stem cells in the brain? And I mentioned those FOXO transcription factors that have been shown to be quote unquote pro-longevity genes and been associated with extension of uh, lifespan in model systems, they, can, uh, they are associated with the extension of two to threefold lifespan in uh, model systems. And in humans are associated with uh, uh, exceptional longevity, like centenarians or supercentenarians. And what we found is that in stem cell, in the in a mouse model, if you remove these quote unquote pro-longevity factors from the brain of mice, the stem cells behave as if they are prematurely old, in the sense that they have defect in self-renewal, the poor shrinks uh, of the neural stem cells, and the stem cells that are lacking the FOXO factors, the prolongevity factors, they are also skewed towards astrocytes at the expense of neurons and oligodendrocytes. So they resemble prematurely old stem cells, suggesting that FOXO transcription factors, FOXO factors play an important role in preserving an intact, youthful pool of adult stem cells in, uh, in the brain. Now, more recently, we've asked, how does it act? What, what is FOXO? FOXO is a transcription factor. And what that means is that it binds to the promoter of a series of target genes and regulate a program of genes in the neural stem cells. And by taking advantage of technologies here at Stanford, we've, uh, of next generation sequencing technologies, we've been able to identify in the adult stem cells, all the, in an unbiased manner, all the target genes that FOXO transcription factors are bound to. It's about 1,000, uh, 2,000 of them, actually. And those genes are interesting because they really provide us with an idea of the network that FOXO is regulating in the adult neural stem cells, and thereby give more molecular handles than to preserve longer the pool of neural stem cells. So it's involved in preventing premature neurogenesis, 
pr promotes oxidative resistance to stress and what's called proteostasis or protein homeostasis, a way to maintain the protein in our brain in their well-shaped form and preventing them from prematurely aggregating, which would be very detrimental. So that's for the role of longevity genes in the brain, in an adult brain. But another question that we've been asking more recently, again, by taking advantage of uh, the wealth of new genomic techniques here that are constantly being developed here at Stanford and also in the world, is in an unbiased manner, could we probe if stem cells, because of their rejuvenating or regenerative function, age in a different manner than other cells in the brain that uh, they are, uh, um, uh, the, more, the cells that they originate from or cells that are more differentiated. And for this, we went back to the lineage of neurostem cells. So in fact, neurostem cells are in a compli complex niche, which is very interesting, in fact, because it provides us with different cell, cell types to probe. The astrocytes, which are differentiated cells but are thought to be the source of stem cells, quiescent neurostem cells that stay in the tissue in a dormant manner for the life of the organism, and then those activated neurostem cells, the ones that have the self-renewal property uh, that can then give rise to neuroprogenitors and then new neurons. So this is a project that, had been that has been spearheaded by a graduate student in the lab here uh, at Stanford. And I'm just going to summarize it in the next few slides. And what's nice is that what we've been able to do by using a technique called FAX, fluorescence activating cell sorting, is to really pur uh, freshly isolate and purify those very rare populations of cells from the brain of young animals as well as old animals. And it's uh, pretty complex the way you would uh, purify those cells, but suffice it to say that by the combination of six surface markers that, that characterize different cell types, those different cell types, we've been able to isolate um, the niche stem cells, the astrocytes, the quiescent neurostem cells, the activating neurostem cells, the neuroprogenitor, five different population of cells from the same mouse. Uh, either a young mouse or an old mice, and then we can use large-scale genomic technology, such as, for example, transcriptomic analysis, to probe in an unbiased manner what happens, what's the aging rate, if you wish, of those cells. So, and then just to summar summarize this here, what we were surprised and intrigued about, and I'd be happy to answer uh, questions about this in the question and answer session, this is unpublished work, is that there seems to be different ways in which cells age, at least at the transcriptional level. So here you see the differential, differential gene expression. So it's a global view, if you wish, of transcriptional aging of each different cell types. And what you can see is that they are uh, and colored are the genes that are significantly different, upregulated or significantly downregulated. And you can see that endothelial cells, are the differentiated astrocytes, the, the dormant stem cells, they exhibit a number of genes that are down or up regulated during the aging process. So they exhibit changes, changes with age. But what was curious to us and what we are fascinated by is the fact that the self-renewing neurostem cells, they do not, in fact, exhibit transcriptional changes with age. You take an old cell from an old mice that's the equivalent of an 80-year-old human, its transcriptional profile, the transcriptional profile of its neurostem cells seems to be uh, in an unbiased manner, pretty equivalent to the transcriptional profile of, a, uh, of cells from a young animal. So somehow the neural stem cells have a young, quote unquote, transcriptional profile, even though they come from uh, uh, an old animal. So this is, a, this is fascinating, and I'm just going to, for this part, summarize the conclusions that we've come with and the implications and exciting future directions that we're interested in pursuing. Longevity genes can protect, like FOXO, for example, can protect the reservoir of neurostem cells throughout lifespan, which could be a very interesting to help protect this important population of cells. Neurostem cells trans, uh, 
the no, transcriptional, the, the quiescent, the dormant neural stem cells transcriptionally age more than their activated progenitor, the self-renewing one. So the self-renewing stem cells age less than the uh, other cells in the brain. And then the question becomes, does activation of neural stem cells could rejuvenate the old stem cell, or is there a selection uh, of the better one in the brain? It's, it really raises a lot of fascinating questions. And we are now using a um, single cell approach as well to try to tease apart and really see at the single cell level what happens during aging in those intriguing, rejuvenating cell, uh, regenerating cells in the brain. And of course, I've told you a lot about the cellular aspects of this, but an interesting future direction is to see or to test whether, how and whether this connects to cognitive function and whether indeed preserving or reactivating the pool of stem cells can be important for cognitive function. Okay, so that's for our work in, uh, in the neural stem cells. And in the remaining part of my talk, what I thought I would do is introduce you to a new model that we are developing in our lab and that we are hoping uh, to develop for the community to really test in a really high throughput manner and discover genes or drugs that can influence lifespan. And this new model is the African turquoise killifish Dothobryonchus furzeri, and it was spearheaded in my lab by a very talented postdoc, Dario Valenzano, who now has his own lab at the Max Planck in Germany. So what is this project came about? As I said, the discovery, which was critical for the aging field, of genes that can regulate lifespan did not originate from human, even though it bear on human genetics. It originated from model organisms that live very short. You can do a lot of experiments. You can do screen with them. And they all share this characteristic of living uh, very short, which was really critical for this. But it is important to note that those model organisms are invertebrates, and they lack some of the critical features, actually, of human aging. They lack bone, they lack a true blood, they uh, lack an adaptive immune system, they lack some aspect of inflammations, and of course, their, their brain is, uh, is more uh, minimal than uh, vertebrate brains. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, at least for model organisms for lifespan or aging studies, Mouse and zebrafish have been used, and those are terrific um, genetic models. But they are relatively long-lived for an experiment. So mouse live two and a half to three years, so you can do pretty much one experiment. It's very expensive as well. Uh, zebrafish, actually, it's even worse. It lives five to six years. So we felt that this fish really uh, filled an important niche. It filled this gap, basically, because it is a vert it's a fish, so it's a vertebrate. That means it has all those organs and tissues, but it lives very short. So it is uh, in the order of, uh, of the invertebrate model organism. So what is this African killifish? It originates, as its name indicates, from Africa, from Zimbabwe and Mozambique, but they are killifishes all over the world, and they tend to habitate, to, to populate very extreme, uh, unfavorable types of habitat. And they tend to all be relatively short-lived overall, but the shortest-lived of all is this African killifish. And where it lives in Zimbabwe and Mozambique is in those ephemeral transient ponds of water that stay around only during a very brief period of time, four months during the rainy season, and then the ponds completely dry up during the dry season. So the fish has presumably adapted in evolutionary times to have an explosive growth, fecundity, mate, and generate the next population. Uh, during the, the rainy season, so have an extremely short life cycle and lifespan here, and then in order to survive the dry season, it has to uh, survive drought. So, and the way it survives drought is by having its embryos enter a state of suspended animation called diapause, where they can survive for years, actually. And then when water comes about, the whole cycle starts again. So, uh, in the lab, those fish, you can maintain them in plentiful water, so you can skip this stage of diapose, and you can really have the short life cycle here. 
And we adore you, Valenzano, uh, when he joined my lab and then after uh, he's gone back several times, in fact, with uh, members of my lab in the world, he captured different populations of this fish all across the Limpopo River that runs from uh, here, Zimbabwe, all the way to Mozambique in the, the ponds that are coming out of the drainage system for this. Established them in the lab, that's uh, the lab. <laughs> and then in the lab, what's really neat is that those African killer fish, they, are, uh, they, they recapitulate their short lifespan. So they are the shortest lived vertebrate that can reproduce in captivity. They live four to six months. Despite the fact that they live short, they do display aging phenotype. They have fertility decline, muscle decline, learning deficit, even neoplastic lesions. They have signs of neurodegeneration as well. Uh, there exist different strains, you know, from all those different ponds, and they exhibit differences in lifespan, which is interesting genetically because it helps identify genes that are important for lifespan. But really, when we had this fish, so Dario set it all up in the lab, and this is really uh, fantastic to try um, and, and, and identify different uh, drugs, for example, that affect lifespan. But really what was missing was all the genetic and genomic tools that are so necessary to be able to manipulate the system or even uh, just identify genes in that system. So that's what a new postdoc in the lab, Itamar Harrell, set out to do, which is to really design a platform, a genomic, uh, genetic and genomic platform for the African killerfish. And he was helped by this, uh, by the fact that we are also uh, have two postdocs who are bioinformaticians who help for sequencing the genome. So what we went ahead and did is uh, basically just brute force sequencing and assembling de novo the genome of this fish. We have several genomic data sets, whether it's transcription, epigenetic, uh, which helps us to annotate the genome. So it's really nice now because we have the genome, we made it, we made a website, it's accessible for the community, so we, if you have a favorite gene, you can see what its orthologs are in this short-lived fish and potentially the variants that it has in this fish. But still, it did not allow us to manipulate it. So really what made a big difference was CRISPR-Cas9, the genome editing tools. And what we decided to do is edit a number, if, is really to mutate a number of genes that have been implicated in, in pathways that have been implicated in what's called the hallmark of aging. That's a review that was published recently that indicates that Basically, for aging, there are about nine hallmarks, whether it's nutrient changes, chromatin regulation, telomere damage, stem cells, the APOE genes for neurodegeneration, senescence aspects, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, and et cetera. So we took genes all across these nine hallmarks of aging and asked, basically, can we use the CRISPR-Cas9 technology then to delete them and have mutant fish that would recapitulate some of the features, even of human uh, defects, with this. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, I'm going to present you uh, uh, examples, because we use that as an example for telomerase, which is very important for human aging. And in fact, there are, the humans, there are humans that have defects in TERT, an enzyme, the enzyme that's important for helping the telomere stay long. Those humans exhibit premature, signs of premature aging. So they have defects in their stem cells. They, they actually exhaust their stem cells prematurely. And so this is just to uh, summarize what we did. So we inje you inject, uh, you do CRISPR-Cas9 on the TERT genes, which help you make a specific deletion in the TERT genes in the genome. So this is really very, it fries open the ability to do very specific aspects of genome editing in this fish. And what's nice is that uh, even if you're not a, whoops, sorry. A, uh, a telomere biologist, what you can recognize is that wild type fish can, no, normal fish like we do, can elongate telomeres, but fish that are uh, deficient, that have this mutation, can no longer elongate their telomeres. When you cannot, when a fish cannot elongate their telomeres, like humans, 
they are outwardly normal at first. But then, so the fish are actually outwardly normal, like humans actually, who do have defects in telomeres. But the fish exhibit defects in all the tissues that have stem cells in them, gut, blood, uh, or that have uh, rapidly proliferating stem cells, like gut, blood, the testis, uh, and they have no defects in tissues that don't have too, uh, as many stem cells like muscles, and we're currently evaluating the brain of those individuals, and we're very excited about this. Okay, so this was uh, just to show that basically we can, in fact, this was a proof of principle that we can use this fish to manipulate it, and we've done now many different uh, uh, mutants of this, and as a toolbox for the community, you can really like rapidly mutate your favorite genes involved in your favorite disease, maybe a neurological, a neurodegenerative type of disease, and really test it in a longitudinal manner, because now the fish will live four to six months, so it's e easier, much easier to follow as a function of age the effect of the disease. So with this, I'd like to uh, conclude on the African killifish part. We've uh, hoped that uh, we, this can be used by the community then as a high throughput platform to screen for genes and small molecules, drugs that impact vertebrate lifespan with all the vertebrate features. We are very excited of, exciting of using this fish for brain aging and neural stem cells rejuvenation because now we can follow what happens and it's uh, in the course of four to six months, so that's very powerful. And then finally, we feel that with the explosion of human variants that are important for disease with all these genomes uh, that we've heard in the previous talk, uh, all those variants, all those genes being discovered, a lot of those variants and even genes are lacking a function, an organismal function, and this provides a model for disease and rapidly testing the effect of human genes or human variants with the possibility to do longitudinal studies and prediction. And with this, I'd like to thank members of my lab, and in particular, Dina, uh, Ashley, um, Katya, Liz, uh, for the uh, neural stem cells part, and uh, Param, Itamar, Berenice, and also Dario, who started all this for the fish part. And thank you very much for your time, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, Anne, that was wonderful. Again, there are runners with mics. Thanks for a great talk. Um, question about the centrogenarians with a FOXO3 mutation. Do they show the same cognitive declines that you see in the general population with aging? So this is what's really, I forgot to mention that, and thanks for bringing that up, because that's really what's fascinating about those centenarians that have the FOXO3 allele, is that they, they tested uh, them, in fact, they followed them through time. They didn't know which one necessarily would become centenarians, but they had longitudinal studies, and they exhibited age match, like let's say when they were 70 year old or 80 year olds before, they always exhibited higher cognitive functions than, uh, and also just higher functions in all the different tests that, they, that, that people had used, which made the authors of those studies postulate that those genes were perhaps like really health genes in the sense that they would maintain, they wouldn't just like prevent a disease in one particular tissue, but they would have a systemic effect in, uh, having the organism be more youthful. Now that may be with some drawback and we can discuss that uh, later on, but yeah. In terms of cognitive function, it's very good. Yes, uh, Great talk. Uh, again on the FOXO3 FOXO and the centenarians, uh, is there any understanding of in the alleles that the centenarians have? Are they protein coding changes? Are there changes in expression? What they're doing? Yes. So that's something that we've been very interested in in testing because we've worked on FOXO for a long time, and it's not as simple. So the the simple answer is that it does not seem to be a coding variance. The the variants that were identified are in the second intron of the FOXO genes, which is very long and does. 
contain many regulatory uh, enhancers. So one, uh, one uh, hypothesis would be that they are indeed regulatory, those types of regulatory variants. And um, we've, uh, so then it makes it a little bit harder to try and see what they do. So that's one thing that we've been um, doing in collaboration with the group at Einstein, which has access to centenarians, is to try to determine what are the allele, if the al different alleles in the FOXO3 genes uh, lead to different expression or activity in the end, like uh, of the, of the FOXO transcription factors. It's on the 23andMe, uh, I, I have no uh, uh, conflict of interest with 23andMe, but it's in the, uh, the 23andMe SNP, so one can see right away whether one has uh, the, the centenary, if one has done that, one can see right away whether one has the uh, longevity uh, allele. <laughs> Other questions, please raise your hand. Yeah, come on up, and then Bill, why don't you ask while the mic is making its way. And uh, my question is a little bit related. Uh, is, do you think that the effects of FOXO are primarily mediated through this effect on stem cells that you showed, or do you think it may have many, a whole, you know, palette of other effects as well? And then I didn't see FOXO in your circle of aging, and I was wondering why not. Yeah, so, uh, so the first, to answer your first question, it's probably like FOXO, so one thing that Ashley, she has, she's setting up her own lab now at Brown, and one of her projects is to identify the different, the, she's done chip seek, so genomics of FOXO bound, bound targets in different tissues, and the idea behind that, and we're still collaborating on that aspect, is to identify the core FOXO targets, the ones that are present in every single tissues and in every single organism, and then the tissue-specific targets. Then once you know that, you can perhaps, uh, you have the handle to assess the questions of whether um, FOXO in the, oh, yeah, I guess you could do that with genetics as well, but we feel like with the, the targets, it gives us some handle to assess whether FOXO in this tissue or in stem versus differentiated is more important. We don't know the answer yet, and my prediction at this point would be that it, it's probably acting in several cell types in order to coordinate you know, these types of systemic, general, global effect on health. Okay, so now in terms of the fish, so the fish, uh, like humans, have several foxholes. Uh, and this is one of the reasons, like at the first, for the first, we are going to do FOXO in the fish, but they have five FOXO, humans have four, and in terms of genetics, whenever you have redundancy and you're trying to make knockout mutations, it puts you into the, uh, the, the, the camp of having to do like several complex uh, crosses and et cetera. So we decided first to try genes like telomerase, TURT, which just have one. Uh, copy, but certainly it's something very interesting to do. So first, a comment. I love killifish because one of the uh, extreme environments that they live in is New Jersey, where I grew up, so I'm very, <laughs> very fond of them. Um, so, you know, you, you in some sense got to start with model organisms instead of humans because model organisms get old, and if fish get schizophrenia, we have trouble interviewing them, so we, we had to start with humans. But, um, but and maybe I'm just seeing everything as a nail because I have a hammer, but for human quantitative traits, which actually adult height is the best studied, but these neuropsychiatric cognitive traits and aging, um, undoubtedly they're gonna be highly polygenic. At the tails, they'll always be monogenic, you know, uh, rare monogenic forms, but they're, they're gonna, these are gonna be highly polygenic. And I, I know there have been some uh, large-scale genetic studies of aging. They're a bit hard to do because people don't reach old age for all kinds of reasons other than their, their genomes. But I'm just wondering, you know, whether the community that's working on this is somehow organizing a large, you know, set of human studies so that to generate, again, more hypotheses for you to test in these really interesting animal models. Yes, yeah, certainly. So there are efforts from the community from different, so people have different cohorts of centenarians. Uh, I showed some of them there. So near Barzilai at Einstein has a cohort of Ashkenazi Jews. Yeah, yeah. Then in the Leiden in the Netherlands, they have a very nicely documented uh, cohort. In Sardinia, there is another cohort. Utah has also like, uh, through Ancestry.com, has also like uh, all sorts of different uh, access to centenarians 
centenarians. So yeah, you're very right. Like in terms of um, the centenarian studies, what has really um, affected people in terms of thinking about them in terms of GWAS is what, I mean, you need cases and control. Right. So the cases are, are pretty clear, it's the centenarians. The controls are always less clear because you don't know. I mean, you would have to have dead people so that you're sure that they're not centenarians because they might, I mean, in the population, some of the people might become centenarians. Then you have to know that they have died of natural causes and et cetera. So that complicates matter. And also what complicates matter is the realization, even for the cases, that in fact what we considered maybe 10 years ago as amazingly old age, like reaching 90, for example, and that was sometimes put in those cases. In fact, 90 is the new, 90 is the new 60, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so that basically, like, that's another thing to consider is that where do you draw the cursor and what do you consider like separates the cases from the controls? Uh, one possibility that, you know, at, at least in the lab we discuss, we don't have access ourselves to, to but would be to do more regression, like really integrate the power of statistics to instead of saying, oh, here are the cases, here are the controls, you do a really nice statistical, yes, regression through the lifespan, yeah. Other questions? Uh, just a quick question about throughout this list of, of any, any sort of manipulations that you listed that would actually enhance longevity. Have you been also keeping track of the cancer incidence, whether whether the, the balance is shifting so much that, you know, it's, it's kind of detrimental in that way? Yes, so that's a good point because, of course, cancer is an uh, age-dependent disease. And so on the one hand, you could imagine that, you know, like if you are prolong prolonging lifespan or healthy, li healthy life, you will delay cancer. Uh, on the other hand, you're right to point that there is also this balance because what we're trying to do, like reactivating stem cells and et cetera, could also lead, in fact, to more cancer. So one has, uh, and same thing with the rejuvenation, the blood factor from the young, who knows, maybe some of them have some uh, tumorigenic role. So um, what's interesting, again, like looking at the human um, population, for example, that has the FOXO allele and that, for example, is more healthy, cognitively speaking, they, it's interesting that they also don't have, um, they have a lower, actually, incidence of cancer. So for sure, it's feasible then to uncouple variants that can extend the lifespan from those variants that can affect cancer. But one has to always be very mindful of the rejuvenating strategy because, uh, and, and especially with the stem cell strategy, because that's also a very very close to the cancer cells, absolutely. Hi, uh, thank you again for a great talk, Anne. Um, I have a question about the neural stem cell, the activated and the quiescent one. Have you uh, looked at the epigenome of, say, young versus old uh, activated neural stem cell? Because I was wondering whether uh, there's a specific set of genes that's turned on, so there's a specific transcriptome for the activated ones, and when it differentiates, it will turn into this old stem cell, uh, old cells again. Yeah, so that's a great question and, question, and we haven't done yet a full epigenetic studies on them. The reason being um, technical at first, because those are very rare populations of cells, and for histone mark at least, like you, you require hundreds of thousands of cells, although now the technology is getting better. One thing that we have started to do is attack seek because attack seek, as you know, can uh, really accommodate uh, smaller populations of cells, even single cells now. So Ben has been uh, doing that in the lab. Uh, but of course, for attack seek, it's more complex to deconvolute in terms of the factors because you have all information about, um, you know, chromatin accessibility. So we haven't yet uh, been at the stage where we can convolute back to a specific transcription factor. But that's a great question. It would be very interesting going forward. Yeah. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.